Welcome to the first episode of uh, Robotics Podcast Project, a side uh, project of Weekly Robotics. Today, with me, uh, we have Professor Oak Ishbert, who is a professor at EPFL uh, at Lausanne, Switzerland, and also uh, the head of Biorobotics Lab. Thank you for uh, having me here in your office. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so maybe we could start with uh, how did you get into robotics? Yes, so, so in fact I've always been interested and fascinated by animal locomotion. So my, uh, during my PhD work I was already working on computer, computer models, simulations of like swimming in lamprey, in primitive eel-like fish, or swimming and walking salamanders, so that was all in simulation. And I always had the dream to bring this to real life, to real robotics and, and work on, on robotics. So the robotics came later during my career. Um, when During my studies, I, I had some side projects on building robots, doing like some competition of robotics. And uh, it's only later that I started doing real robotics. Uh, so you were always um, like half and half between uh, uh, biology and robotics? Or uh, if you were to weigh this in, how, how would you weigh this? Yes, yeah. so I was trained first as a physicist and then I was very fascinated by computational neuroscience. So the, I started by more being a computational neuroscientist, making um, neural network models of the circuits in the spinal cord that control locomotion. And then I realized more and more how important the interaction with the environment, the, the embodiment, the physics is, is important. And, and of course, you can simulate it to some extent, but having real robot interaction with real environments is, is really important. And that's how I, I started being more and more interested in, in, in robotics. I, in fact, also did a bit of robotics sideways before doing locomotion. I worked a bit uh, like during my studies on, on making uh, wheel robots that had to solve some task, like some kind of what's called a rugby competition. And I did uh, some work on multi-robots collaborating, wheel-based robots collaborating, uh, Kepra small robots. And I, I then worked into humanoid robots at USC when I worked at, uh, with Professor Stephen Sal, a colleague at, at USC. He, he had access to a wonderful humanoid robot where we, we studied then movements. And it's only later when I came back as a professor at EPFL that I started focusing on locomotion, which, which is always has been one of my main, main interests. And since then, in fact, we have many projects in my lab interested in, in, at the inter intersection between biology and robotics, mainly around all the concept of locomotion and locomotion control. Mm -hmm. I've seen your um, presentation uh, for World Minds, and there I believe you said that there is uh, a reflex mechanism uh, that normally in body, uh, it's not really handled by uh, the brain, uh, but it could be handled by the nervous system. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah, well, the thing is, is the spinal cord circuit. So, okay. so indeed, uh, in all vertebrates animals, we, of course, have the main brain, the main part of the brain, which like the motor cortex, the cerebellum, uh, or all these kind of parts of the brain that are really in the head. But the spinal cord is an extension of the brain, of the nervous system. And, and it's a very important control center for locomotion. And, and people completely underestimate how important the, the spinal cord is. Because it's really like a second brain, a very old brain, like mm -hmm. very primitive circuits, but still very sophisticated. And it's really in the spinal cord that you find all the neural circuits necessary for locomotion. And uh, the fact that a, a chicken can head, run without a head is, is because its spinal cord is functioning. It can do all the control of all the muscles. It can even have feedback loop control. And basically, the spinal cord is really a beautiful uh, control circuit that I would like to understand. And it looks like the spinal cord has changed during evolution. Like uh, um, uh, it was very important for for swimming, of course, for for lamprey-like swimming. And during evolution, it looks like new layers have been added on top of primitive swimming circuits to little by little add, allow uh, legged locomotion with limbs and terrestrial locomotion. And I really would love to understand and use models and robots to understand this evolution of the, the locomotor circuits in vertebrates. Mm -hmm. uh, so you are hoping this will uh, drive your research in the future or you will be able to uh, have th to use this concept in, uh, in robotics? Uh, absolutely. So I, I think here there's a beautiful uh, bidirectional interaction between robotics and neuroscience. 
So on one hand, um, robotics can benefit from inspiration from animal, not only the morphologies, as we already do, but also from the control principles. And here, uh, this concept of spinal cord circuits um, is, is a beautiful way of distributing control. And in some of our robots, we have at a low level, like in microcontrollers, we replicate the functionality of the spinal cord. And that means that high parts of the controller do not need to worry about all the motors, like for swimming to walking, but only about modulating the signals to go left, right, or to control speed. And this is exactly how, in nature, different parts of the brain have different responsibilities. And high parts of the brain rarely worry about muscles. They only worry about high-level signals. And it's really the spinal cord that has to control all the muscles, all the signals. And therefore, it's really interesting to take inspiration in robotics from, from the biological circuit. Now, in return, and that's maybe one of the speciality of my lab, is I, I love the idea of using robots as scientific tools. I think robots can be wonderful tools to very systematically implement different models of the spinal cord and very systematically test how they work. Can they replicate animal data or not? Uh, how does sensory feedback shape these locomotor patterns? And um, in addition to simulation tool, I think robots are really a wonderful tool to do scientific work. And, and, and that's really many of our projects in the lab are, are exactly in that, on that domain. Speaking of uh, ro using robots for science, uh, one of the projects that I think uh, that was in the news last year uh, was your uh, fossil uh, project. I see the poster of it, I think, on the wall. Uh, so could you uh, tell maybe our listeners uh, what was the input that you had and uh, how did you create this robot? Yeah, that, that was for us a very cool project. So, so indeed, we have had many projects where we developed robots for neuroscience, like to understand lamprey, salamander, cat or human locomotion. Uh, but thanks to that, um, a zoologist, John Nyakatura, he approached us to say he, he, had, he had seen our salamander robots and he said, wow, uh, could we work together? Because he had found, he had access basically to a very nice fossil of an old tetrapod, an old, it's in between amphibians and reptiles, a very old animal. And not only he had the skeleton, the fossilized skeleton of that animal, but also the footprints for the same species. So this was a very nice collaboration where using our robotic technology, we could use it to very systematically explore what was the most likely gait of this extinct animal, this animal that doesn't exist anymore. And, and so uh, the work we did is replicate the, the morphology of that animal as well as possible using a robot. We had a real robot and a simulated version of it. And then we use robotics technology on one hand to generate all possible gates that could walk in these footprints of this, but then have different characteristics like different heights or different amplitude of spine movements or different use of different degrees of freedom, different joints in the in the body. And we also use kind of robotics tools to quantify the quality of these gates. So for instance, we can quantify how much energy does a gate use, how much, how well balanced is it? Clearly the animal should not want to, its head to move too much left and right. So the keeping balance was important. How accurate were we to be, to walk in the footprints and several other type of matrix quantifications. So putting the, all this together, we could demonstrate, first of all, that in principle, this animal could have, could have used many gates, many possible gates, so, which is not too surprising because you have many joints, there are many ways of moving in these footprints. But if we looked at the most likely gates, those which have the biggest scores, they were very similar to the caiman, like a, a, a reptile, like a crocodile or a caiman, which is a quite modern and agile animal as opposed to salamanders, which are older and closer to the ground. So using our tools, we could uh, really quantify likely gates and, and, and make this kind of uh, look into the past, finding that the, this animal was using a quite agile and athletic gait. Yeah, so for me, it was a really wonderful uh, collaborative project where uh, an another example of using a robot as a scientific tool for another field of research. Uh, how long did this project take you? So this project was more or less five years mm -hmm. and, and uh, because it really involved a lot of work 
uh, on the robotic side, of course, to make the robots, the simulations, do all the systematic tests. But also in the paper, there's an enormous study of modern animals, like where our colleagues, um, they had X-ray videos of many animals. Um, they quantify the gates and therefore we could very systematically compare what were the prediction for this old ex- Orobatus, the, the fossil, compared to modern animals to see how close or not they are, uh, they were, they possibly were to, to modern animals. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, and about uh, about uh, robots working with animals, uh, I think you had one project with BBC where you uh, cooperated with them. Yeah, that, that was a fun project as well. Is is where um, at some point uh, a producer for the BBC called us because he also had seen the salamander robot, and for they wanted for this very nice documentary called Spy in the Wild, they 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 create a whole series of different animatronics systems, so little robots or devices that look like animals and that had cameras on board. And for them, uh, they, they were, well, they asked us, could you make a crocodile robot for us to, to film real crocodiles or at least, um, uh, try to. So, yeah, so we, we made the robot. They made a wonderful skin, uh, that really looks very realistic. And this was all done in a very short time period. So it was really stressful. Uh, these two were put together only in, in Uganda, in, in Africa, because the, both in terms of the robot and the skin uh, it took quite some time and, and we had to, to rush. And at the end, it was quite exciting for us to have a, something that really looks quite a bit like a crocodile. If you, if you look at the, from far away, you might be tricked to think it's a real crocodile. We didn't have as much interaction with a real animal as we hoped for because it was a bit late in the season. The, uh, the crocodiles were always a bit going away each time we were approaching with a robot. But still, the whole exercise of going into the same uh, environments in which the crocodiles live and, and, and move, tr- test our robots there in the same terrains and everything was very exciting. And, and it's true that for, I would never have expected like uh, 10 years or 20 years ago that one of my robots would be part of a documentary. Mm-hmm. So it was a very uh, fun and interesting experience. And about some other projects, I think you mentioned that uh, your lab is also working on humanoids. Uh, can you tell us a bit about more about that? Yeah, so w- one uh, one aspect of 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 uh, human uh, robotics we interested in is also a, a bit to understand how the spinal cord of humans is implemented. Here, we we interestingly we don't know much about the human spinal cord uh, because it's uh, like it's it's really impossible to record activity of the human spinal cord while while somebody moves. Technically, it's not possible. It would be dangerous. So um, the whole neuroanatomy and neurophysiology of the human spinal cord is, is really unknown. So using models can be useful to see how different types of circuits in the spinal cord interact to generate locomotion. So we have some modeling project on that. We, we apply them also a bit to, to human robots to, to get human robots to walk. And on top of that, we have some more high level studies where where we were interested for instance to see how when two humans walk together carrying for carrying for instance a table or a stretcher to see how they coordinate the gates like uh, as you as you probably know as soon as you physically hold another person by hand or or by through a table you tend to synchronize without consciously doing it you you tend to synchronize mm-hmm. and 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 if you think about it, two people carrying a table together, they become like a quadruped, uh, like a horse with two forelimbs and two hind limbs. And we found out that most pairs of humans, when they walk together, they tend to synchronize, meaning they converge to the same frequency of stepping. And they converge to a gate that would look like a pace gate in an animal. Um, a pace gate is a gate where the two limbs on one side are lifted at the same time. Uh, giraffes use a space gate. Uh, a horse can be trained to do a pace gate. And some pairs of humans were more converging to the trotting gate, which is a diagonal, uh, a diagonally synchronized gate where uh, limbs in diagonal synchronize. And some pairs of people were never synchronizing. But interestingly, most people are synchronizing and it's not conscious. It's really, it's kind of a natural thing that you do. And using our, our uh, human robots, we could demonstrate that in fact, the mechanical coupling tends to have a synchronization f- 
uh, property. So that's why just the mechanics is like coupled, any coupled oscillators, if you couple them a bit, they often tend to synchronize. And, and it was a bit surprising for us that our very complex human robots with very complex controllers and everything, even if you give them slightly different frequencies, if you couple them mechanically through a table, they were also converging to a synchronized gate. So it's a very generic property of couple oscillators that you find even in, in complex machines. That was quite exciting for us. Well, that's, uh, that's really exciting. I never thought about that, yeah. but it makes perfect sense mm -hmm. when you think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and what you would hope um, to achieve in the future, when you look at biorobotics now, uh, with the improvements we've seen over the years, where do you think we are going? And what would be the sort of holy grail of biorobotics? Yeah, so, so there are several. So, so first, in terms of performance, um, we still, we are approaching little by little new animal agility, but we're still very far away. So, of course, uh, here, everybody, and me included, we're always very impressed by what Boston Dynamics does, like with its Atlas and, and legged robots. And it's really beautiful. It's really pushing the state of the art. But still, it's still very far from um, like a cat jumping in a tree, uh, going over branches and then jumping down uh, several meters. Um, same thing for swimming. We're still very far from replicating a dolphin or a tuna swimming. Or even ourselves, our human robots are still not as good as, as anything we do in terms of playing tennis like Roger Federer <laughs> or... or doing sports or so we still there's still many things where in terms of performance we're still not there uh, at the level of locomotion skills of, of animals so one dream is to push the limits into performance so approach agility and, and versatility of, of animals so that would be one dream another dream is to more and more uh, understand this really fascinating mechanism happening in animals so more and more have robots being more and more used to understand and contribute to fundamental science, uh, neuroscience and bio biomechanics. And, and one aspect we started working on is, is bring all this together then to assist a person who has lost locomotion skills. And there, especially in the field of exoskeletons, there's a wonderful uh, combination of work to be done between people from neuroscience, from biomechanics and from robotics to create assistive devices, exoskeletons that can assist and support locomotion. And there are some very exciting things are happening in different fields. We, we started a bit in my lab, but there I think many things can happen in, in, in prosthetics and, and neuroprosthetics. Mm -hmm. uh, and about the assistive technology, uh, do you think we will get uh, at one point um, full synchronization with human body? Because I think right now it's either uh, the signals from the brain or the signals from the muscles. Yeah, th there's still lots of work to, to be done. And, and here it really depends on, on the patient or the pilot. So depending in the, if the pilot is uh, a spinal cord injured person with a full spinal cord lesion that has really no control at all, um, that person requires quite a different assistance that person really needs like a wheelchair on legs or a legged wheelchair because they're um, and and then ideally some kind of natural interface that without thinking too much he or she can control this external device. Then if a person is only partially ha handicapped, so either uh, only a partial spinal cord lesion or a stroke patient which has maybe hemiplegia where one side of the body is 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 paralyzed but not the other or possibly some people, some person with a muscle weakness, that really requires person-specific controllers. And that's very challenging because every person is then different and, and uh, you want to assist and, and not make life more difficult. So you really have to guess properly what, what is the intention of the person. And, and that's a very big challenge because the, uh, yeah, you want you want to be safe. You want to be very reactive. You don't want to slow down the person, and you have to be specific. and And there is still a lot of work to be done to see how to properly interface. As you said, one way of interfacing is uh, taking EMG signals, muscle signals, and try to augment them. Others might be to measure 
interaction forces uh, very rapidly and try to augment the person. So if the person moves in one way, measure an interaction force and try to follow smoothly the person. Or, or there could be other interfaces, like maybe um, uh, EEG, uh, like uh, surface electrodes measuring brain activity, or maybe inv invasive electrodes, to, to try to guess the motor commands, what, what are the, the high-level motor commands. And this is a, yeah, a big field of research, how, how to understand this. You need good progress in, in the hardware, on, on the software side. Uh, there are many things still to be done on, on these topics. I think there is a, a challenge uh, here in Switzerland called Cybatlon. Uh, is your group taking part in that in any way? So, so um, I, I'm hosting a group by Dr. Mohamed Bouri, who, who, who is making an exoskeleton and preparing for the Cybatlon. They, they, they are in very good stages to do uh, one of the Cybatlon competitions. So Cybatlon is a wonderful competition. They, they do many, or I think six or seven competitions in parallel and, and uh, on, on different topics. The, the one Mohamed Bouri will participate to will be the exoskeleton for spinal cord injured pilots. And, and that is a wonderful competition because like for the first time you start to have benchmarks that are really the same for all the teams. So people have to, they get a score by how well um, the pilot can cross a terrain with different steps. Like uh, the beginning is already quite difficult, is standing up from a, a soft uh, sofa chair and then uh, zigzagging through uh, a terrain and then climbing stairs, going downstairs, opening a door. And, and uh, you have to do all this in a sequence and you get a score by how fast you are. And you get a penalty if some of these uh, key steps you cannot perform. So this is a, a wonderful way of having a bench, a quantif yeah, a quantification, a score, a really a quantitative score of how well um, the pilot is doing. And this is the first time where you can then compare different technologies, different ways of doing and, and have a way of, of people uh, exercising for the same benchmark. So this, this is a very beautiful uh, competition, yes. Um, and switching a bit of focus, one of the projects uh, I've seen on your website is called Roombots. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about this project, how it was uh, conceived? Yeah, so Roombots is what I call a bit my science fiction project. Uh, in a sense, it's, it's, uh, the, the idea of Roombots is to use self-reconfigurable modular robots. So think about Lego, uh, like Le the Lego of robotics, little modules that, can, that are made of different parts. And on top of that, that they, they can actively attach and detach to each other to change morphology over time. So the concept of Roombots came uh, by the fact that up to now, all our robots, they were always modular. So uh, quite rapidly, we can add limbs, remove limbs, add a tail or remove a tail. But here, I had a colleague, Pierre Dilambour from EPFL, who at some point approached me because there was some op option of funding to create f adaptive furniture. So, and then we sat, we, sit, we sat together and said, why not use this concept of modular robotics and self-reconfigurable robotics? and other teams in the world, especially in Japan, have worked on that. And then we said, why not bring this concept of self-reconfigurable robotics to furniture to assist someone, for instance, a person in, um, in, a, in a wheelchair. And, and here, so we develop modules that can, they can connect to each other, so they can reconfigure. So from a computer, we can program them to to attach to each other to, to get different shapes. Um, and at the same time, we can plug them into existing furniture. So if, if we attach some the, the, the attachment mechanism to uh, existing furniture, we can then plug in and, and connect to it. And I like this idea of adding then functionalities to furniture around a person. Because if you think about, uh, let's say, someone in a wheelchair at home in a small apartment, it could be very useful to give mobility to all the furniture so that if the person has to cross the room, uh, it could be interesting that the furniture goes away until uh, the person has crossed the room and then the furniture takes back its own its original place. 
Or let's say if uh, if you have lost a remote control and it's fallen on the ground, why not have the table go down, pick it up and bring it to you as opposed to uh, have, um, I don't know, a human robot doing this. So I think there's a whole, whole opportunity to add functionalities and make the whole environment assistive um, by having like these robotic modules in, in the environment. So it's a bit science fiction, but I, I really feel there's something to, to make like this ubiquitous robotics assistive for, for someone. And so we, we developed some prototypes to, to explore this. And even beyond furniture, we, this dream of, of self recoverable robotics can be very interesting for mul multiple applications. Uh, if you think about a, a space station or a Mars or a remote, uh, a remote um, terrain, a place that you cannot reach um, uh, physically with with your uh, with your um, r by a human, why not basically have a system that you can remotely control, reconfigure, and and uh, to 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 change shape and functionality over time, like a satellite reorganizing itself or things like that. So I feel there's a whole field where this reconfiguration, self reconfiguration, can be a big bonus. Possibly also a reconfigurable uh, factory line. If you need something where you need to make small productions and you want your factory line to change uh, every day or every week, being self-reconfigurable could be a nice property. And, and marginally, my dream is to, to make this hardware, these devices, and, and share them with the community. And then, like Lego, I think uh, everybody's impressed what the imagination, what people find out and can do with Lego. I, I think if you... If you give this to anyone, designers or any hobbyist, my dream is to see, yeah, the, to to get get give building blocks that can do where people really find do crazy things and, and beautiful things with them. So that would be a long term dream. Yeah. So you would you consider open sourcing the project? Yes. The, the uh, yeah, that would be perfect to open sources. Um, uh, we, in fact, many uh, many things we have done are already open source, so uh, mm -hmm. people can easily replicate sub parts of it. And I like the spirit of open source; that really helps a lot robotics, mm -hmm. uh, so that people can replicate things and and uh, improve them. Uh, is there anything that you found personally useful in open source robotics? Yeah, well, uh, these days uh, there are many things uh, happening around ROS. Mm -hmm. the robotics op operating system. So um, this is open source and many libraries for machine vision for things are are, are now uh, developed open source and, and can be shared. And, and that's very useful that, that you can like, uh, like in robotics, there's not a single team that will have all the expertise needed to do, I don't know, locomotion control, navigation, mechanics, mechatronics, uh, so you always need to collaborate. So, mm -hmm. so op being open source is, is very important. Also, many simulators now are open source. So we use a lot of webots developed mm -hmm. by Cyberbotics, who uh, it's a company that recently made webots open source. And that, that's great for us to share how, how many of our robots have a simulated model. And, and so that's, it's easy to share simulation on real hardware, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so open source is, is very important for robotics. Uh, and so... Since you mentioned ROS, I assume some of your robots use ROS actively? Yeah, we started doing that. To, to be honest, so far, many do not do it because mm -hmm. just for locomotion and sometimes programming things on very simple microcontrollers, yeah. not even having an operating system, so just being uh, low computation power, we, we did many things without so far. Okay. But now, in like... Some of our projects where we adapt our salamander robots for search and rescue mm -hmm. uh, in collaboration with other Swiss colleagues within the something that's called the NCCI in Robotics, National Center of Competence in Robotics. This is really shared work among many teams in Switzerland. And there, uh, one of our goals is to have like a fleet of robots, both flying and ground robots, that update dyna maps dynamically. Mm -hmm. Like all the perception is shared in a common map that's updated by different points of view. And there, uh, ROS is a good tool to, to share, uh, like I'm not at all an expert in machine vision, but now uh, being compatible with ROS really allows to collaborate and have a common framework. Mm -hmm. So um, for anything that relies on, on more navigation, vision, all that, 
things where we don't have the expertise, ROS is, is very, very interesting. Mm. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and coming back to uh, those robots, what would you say is the current development le uh, level? How far are you from the finished product? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. So, so first of all, we have prototypes that, but that are completely uh, house developed. Mm -hmm. And that's really a challenge in, in, it makes it very expensive. So very time consuming to, to make and, and to develop. So we, we managed to have 12 modules, functional modules. Each of them has three motors. So in total is 36 motors. It allows to do many things, but still it took a long time to get there and do all the mechatronics and everything. So, um, and they're still a bit fragile. Not, don't, not that fragile, but still, they, for instance, they lack a bit of sensing. Mm -hmm. uh, the reconfiguration planning often needs a bit of human intervention because like just the locking is not completely aligned and, and we need to help it a bit. Now, here is then a challenge for being an academic lab. Um, we, uh, at some point you need to make it really a product or, or go go beyond this this kind of prototypes in labs is you need much more manpower and money and and this is not something that we can do and we don't we don't have the money to do so here ideally at some point you like to have a startup that managed to collect funds and and does all the engineering to make it very sturdy mm -hmm. cheap easy to produce and that's something where academia or a lab like me, we are not the best suited to that, to do mm -hmm. that. That's, all, that's something people sometimes forget, but we, at the university, we are, we have to publish papers, we have to push the state of the art and innovate all the time and, mm -hmm. and do things that no one else has done. Otherwise, like our PhD students cannot get a thesis. And these constraints are quite different from uh, making a product because mm -hmm. making a product means iterating many things to make things easy to produce, more robust and everything. Really important engineering, uh, but a bit more traditional engineering. And clearly not something you can publish. You will never publish a paper on, on making a thing uh, like uh, fault-free for, for 10,000 hours because it's, it's very classical engineering. Mm -hmm. Still very important. But, but, so, and, and, and that's always a challenge for academia is, is, is um, yeah, you will not be able to do this and, and, and not, not even to be able to compete. For instance, mm -hmm. I think Boston Dynamics is doing amazingly well because they have very clever brains, but also many technicians that maintain the hardware and, and, and push the limits of good, very solid hardware. Um, that's much, hard, much harder to do in, in academia. Mm -hmm. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and about your lab, uh, how many researchers do you currently have? So we, I think um, we are now more or less eight PhD students and mm -hmm. uh, four or five postdocs. Okay. Uh, so um, it always kind of varies a bit depending on the amount of funding we get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And their profile, is it uh, mostly robotics or mixed? Uh, some of them focusing on mechanics, maybe? Or? Yeah, no, you, you, yeah, we, that's a good question. So uh, the background is quite diverse. Some is more mechanical engineering uh, and two aspects of mechanical engineering. Some being more control or more really into mechanical design. Some people have more an EE background, electrical engineering for, for the um, electronics parts. Some have more computer science background uh, for, for all the software and the programming. Some are more biomedical because we have many projects more into yeah, the biomedical aspects. And, and sometimes we have had physicists as well, uh, mm -hmm. more for the fundamental uh, like neural network models. So it depends a bit on the project. And that's, I would say, the strength of my lab is, is to be... It's really the teamwork where everyone benefits from the expertise of others that 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 helps everyone, mm -hmm. and and you need it to 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 make good progress. I think I'm. Uh, I don't have any more questions written, uh, but maybe is there anything that you would like to share or something that uh, you find really interesting in your field? Yeah, maybe a few thoughts. Well, well, well first of all. The more I work in robotics, the more I'm really impressed by animals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you become very humble. 
uh, by trying to replicate, understand, and, and yeah, understand and replicate, you realize we know little and, and, and what we know is not sufficient yet to replicate. And, and seeing an animal move around, jump, uh, plan complex movements, react very rapidly, do all kind of agility, you realize uh, nature is really amazing, very beautiful. And we're still far from understanding it and replicating it. And even when you think about it, uh, the animal kingdom has many more constraints than our robots. Like animals have to grow. Mm -hmm. They have to start from a few cells and become a whole adult. So this, this whole process of development is amazing. The whole process of healing and, and adapting to changing body shapes, I'm, I'm super impressed. Like when you see on YouTube all the videos of uh, an amputee animal, uh, it's amazing how uh, animals rapidly find new gates or new moving around. So there are many things where, where uh, both in terms of fundamental science, understanding it and replicating and bringing it to robotics, I, I, I think we still have a lot of work to do. And it's very exciting work at the same time because it's very interdisciplinary. So that's one thing I, I, I love and, and I'm, I'm humbled and... and, and and yeah, uh, fascinated by animal, the animal kingdom. And maybe one more thought is, is, is uh, I like the idea of using robots for good. So obviously there's a whole scare of robots either taking over jobs mm -hmm. or, uh, or military robots taking over the world. I, I'm not too worried by each of these, but I think we, as a society, we have still to think about it and, 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 and think carefully about it. And um, I'm personally, for instance, really happy that I don't any, do any military research. I, I really want to do only uh, civilian research. Um, but here, yeah, I, in fact, I'm more worried about uh, ro robots for, for military application than robot taking over jobs. I think robot taking over jobs, uh, I think the society will adapt and, and find new jobs, human jobs or interaction like cobots co and, and do better things together rather than the humans disappearing and not being useful anymore. Humans will always stay more uh, creative and, and can do things better than robots. So the two together will be more useful and we will have to adapt, but I don't think it will remove too many jobs. One thing that worries me a bit more is maybe uh, robotic, uh, military application, robotics. There, there, I think we have to be careful. There, I feel like indeed uh, an army that manages to have better technology, better robots, will, will risk to more easily start a war. Like when, once a war becomes a video game, because everything is done remotely and you have the robots doing the... Uh, the killing for you, the, all the, the, the military things for you. There, I think, from a society point of view, I think it becomes very risky. So there, I think we have to care, be very careful what we do and uh, really put limits. Otherwise, that can get, go in really wrong directions. I think already now with the te technology development uh, from, from advanced countries, uh, war becomes a video game and, and that's really... A bad thing because then you you start wars much easier much more easily so there i think we have to be careful as a society and, and put limits of what what's acceptable but just to finish on a more positive note mm -hmm. yeah i i love robotics i think um, uh, robots can do many good things for society and and maybe one message is not only in applications but also in in fundamental science so something that we forget is a robot can be a very good tool to understand who we are, where we're going, where we came from, this paleontology. And, and I see more and more use of robots as scientific tools, and, and that will be very exciting. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you very much for having me in your office here. And, well, we'll, we'll be following your work uh, on weekly robotics. So if there is uh, anything exciting coming up, I'm sure we'll cover it. Great, yeah, thanks a lot for your interest. Yeah. Thanks.